How do you convince somebody to do what you've done when what you've done has gotten you put on death row? In this second letter to Timothy, Paul recognizing that his departure is at hand, decides to give Timothy a refresher course on ministry fundamentals. One more lesson before dying. And so you have the text before you, your Bible students, this is a seminary, so I can do some things in shorthand. Um, I know the homileticians will not judge me too harshly if I don't give you some um, breathtaking introduction, and startling illustrations, but let's see if we can't just go bare knuckles today. You see in these uh, six verses, the structure is uh, transparent enough. And adjuration, I, I solemnly charge you by the light of his coming, the fact that the king is coming. And then he gives the charge, preach the word. Uh, how should you do it? Uh, in season, out of season, when there's no season. Why should you do it? There's gonna come a time where people will not stand ready to hear sound doctrine, but will go after the latest ear-tickling philosophy. Uh, he goes on to say that I need you to remember everything I've been saying in, in this letter and the previous letter in terms of being serious about ministry, in terms of making the ministry of the word your primary focus, particularly as it relates to the issue of evangelism. And he ends by saying, I want you to fulfill your ministry. Because I'm getting ready to go off the scene. The tra training wheels are going to have to come off. And you're going to need to do the very thing that has gotten me in this trouble. So the structure is, is, is transparent. The thrust is readily discernible. The thrust is those three words, preach the word. And the urgency, the urgency with which we must preach the word is likewise easily discernible, uh, contextually so, because in the immediate context, again, Paul is getting ready to go off the scene, but right there in the text, he talks about the fact that uh, the king is soon to come, and when he appears, he's going to judge the quick and the dead. So you need to be ready, need to be on duty, need to be on call when he shows up, uh, because you will be evaluated, not by the crowd, but by the Christ. I'm preaching already, you just wake up. <laughs> and, and in the larger context, he has uh, just let us know in the previous chapter that this very same word is profitable. Why is it profitable? Because it's God-inspired, it's God-breathed, and it can do a whole lot of different things. It... it it can instruct you in the way that you should go, show you how you're getting off track, help you to get back on track, and train you how to stay on track. But in a more global fashion, it will furnish you to do everything you need to do in order to do the last thing I told you, which is to fulfill your ministry. It's just like when I was growing up, we used to watch uh, every day after school, we used to watch Batman. And the thing I liked about Batman, Batman really didn't have any superpowers. 
He just had a tremendous utility belt. And so in his utility belt, I mean, uh, one time he was messing with Mr. Freeze and that man wasn't even worried because he had some bat soup in his utility belt. And, I mean, he, everything he needed was in his belt. Um, my brothers and sisters, we don't have any superpowers all, but we got a great utility tool at our disposal. And so Paul uh, reminds Timothy in that previous chapter that uh, this word of God that you first heard while nursing at Eunice's bosom and sitting in Lois's lap. This same word that is still my magnificent obsession, even while in jail, because at the end, Paul says, you know what, the last thing, I, what I would really like, if you would just bring the coat that I left and make sure you bring my books and especially the parchments. I still need my tools, even though I'm in prison. Paul uh, gives this sense of urgency in light of that tool, but in light of the dangerous times and the dangerous people that Timothy will have to face. You see that in chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Perilous times. People will not be lovers of God, but lovers of themselves. And all those things that go around go uh, along with that. But let's see if we can't uh, be more pointed. The urgency of this appeal to preach the word, the, the, the basis of that urgency also provides the basis of the proclamation because the reason we have to be so urgent about it is because we have a king that's coming back. And that's really the basis of the message that we must preach because the message is, the, the adjuration, the exhortation is to preach the word. To preach at its heart really, uh, you know, exegetically, etymologically, it means to herald, it means to proclaim, but can I say it this way? The gospel is really an announcement. It's a statement of fact that has implications and entailments. And since uh, we have this gospel, since we have this message that we must preach, Paul is saying, make sure you get the message right. Make sure that when you're standing, that you're preaching the word, preaching the word, heralding the word. Kings have heralds who are authorized and deputized to make special announcements, and the job of a herald is to say what the king said. Paul is saying here to Timothy, with all the gravity that he can muster, given the fact that he is soon to depart, given the fact that the Lord is soon to come, Timothy, I want you to focus in on this fundamental aspect of ministry, and that is the announcement, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that a king is coming, and one day he's going to judge. In other words, it's appointed unto man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. So let's look a little bit deeper because there's only a couple of implications that I want to leave with you today, but let's see what the text says. He says, preach the word, that is to say, make sure you get the announcement correct. Make sure you're saying what the king said without adding anything to it or taking anything away from it, without trying to massage it or manipulate it. Just give the message just like it's been given. You have to do that. But remember, in giving this message, you have to be on call all the time. Be instant, in season. It's a play on the word uh, kairos in, in the Greek. In season, that is a good season. Out of season, that is a, a bad season or no season. Because a season is coming when men will want to have their ears tickled. But you have to be integral in your ministry and not bend or contort the message that the king has given according to the context or according to the crowd, you have to just say what he said the way he said it. Because people are going to, uh, at a point in time, and that time has long since been here, heap unto themselves, uh, pile up to themselves, accumulate those who tickle their ears according to their own desires because they have turned away from the truth. 
But he tells Timothy, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to be awake. I want you to be vigilant. I want you to be watchful in all things. I want you to be serious about your ministry. I need you to understand that in this Christian enterprise, you're going to have to endure hardship. He, he mentioned that before in chapter, do, chapter two, that you're going to have to endure hardship like a good soldier. Why? Because we're not on a playground, we're in a battlefield. And no soldier uh, gets entangled with civilian life and no soldier complains when he gets shot, he or she gets shot at. This is a spiritual warfare. He goes on to talk about that we have to do the work of an evangelist and fulfill our ministry. Let's dig a little bit deeper. He says this ministry of the word, we're going to have to allow the ministry of the word, preaching the word, whether it be in the, in the temple, in a storm, in the prison, on Mars Hill, whether it be uh, in the Sunday school classroom, whether it be in the seminary classroom, we're going to have to do it and let the word speak for itself in its, all its variegated and multifaceted uh, functions and applications. That is to say, uh, if you'll look in your Bible at verse 2, he says, not only do we have to uh, be ready, but we have to let this lion loose. And when it's loose, uh, in some cases, it will convict or reprove. In some cases, it will warn or rebuke. In other cases, it will exhort or encourage. The concept is very simply this, that when you let the word do what it's designed to do, and when you tell the truth truthfully, for those who need convicting, it will convict. For those who need warning, it will warn. And for those who need encouragement, it will encourage. But here's the key, you have to do it with patience and sound instruction. That is to say, as it relates to preaching this word and as it relates to fulfilling our ministry, Paul is letting Timothy know and letting us know as we listen in on their conversation that true spiritual growth requires servants of the word who are willing to serve with long suffering, willing to serve patiently and willing uh, to serve uh, this doctrine in a way that will be healthy. What I'm trying to say is very simply this, that we live in an age of Chia pet Christians. Does anybody know what a Chia pet is? I'm uh, dating myself, but back in the day, they used to have these commercials where uh, you could send off and you could get these uh, things called Chia pets, and really all it was was these herbs you could uh, uh, you could paste them onto uh, these applications and then water them, and then within a few days, you had greenery. Paul says here uh, that we're not after chia pets, but we're after redwoods. And in order to get a redwood ministry, is going to take some time. I need to challenge you, my brothers and sisters. We've all heard stories. I just want to spend some pastoral time talking to you today. We've all heard stories of churches, and we see them in the various magazines where uh, Bishop Scooterboo or, or Reverend Treble Bridges, he started out, with, started out with 12 members, and now a mere three years later, he has 20,000 members. Well, that's not the norm. See, you can get chia pets overnight, but if you want a forest, it might take a few generations. Paul is saying here, with my dying breath, I need you to understand that the ministry of the word is the prime thing, but understand that it's going to take time. Just like a patient farmer, he talks about in chapter two. Just like a patient farmer doesn't throw the seeds down one day and expect something to come up the next day, so you who will be charged with this serving of the word must understand that you got to keep serving patiently, that you can't get tired of repeating yourself, that you can't grow weary of going over it over and over again. Why? Because there's going to come time, a time where people will be flittering, not flittering, flitting 
hither, thither, and yon, trying to find people to tickle their ears as opposed to nourishing their souls. Brothers and sisters, he says, this ministry of the word has to be done with great patience and doctrine. He goes on to, to point out in our text that we have to endure hardship like a good soldier. That is to say, it's not going to be easy all the time. Uh, for some, God is going to call you to a Spartan ministry. That is to say, uh, my father and my mentors, uh, very often in their ministry, they weren't paid in money. They were paid in hams and greens and chickens. Uh, Nowadays, uh, some people won't go to minister unless they have uh, a package uh, that ensures that their standard of living will not be below that that they would acquire if they were in corporate America. But can I let you in on a secret? The king never promised to compete with corporate America. He said that one day I'm coming back and I'm going to be asking you, did you say what I said? And did you use what I gave you? Paul points out we're going to endure hardship, and so we have to do the work of an evangelist. We have to do the work of an evangelist. That is to say the primary thrust of the ministry must be to win souls. Even as we're dealing with the saints, we're equipping them to do the work of the ministry. But the primary work of the ministry is to reconcile men back to God uh, because that's what Christ did. God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world back to himself. And so we have to make sure that even in our proclamation, our public proclamation, that we're not allowing that to substitute for private evangelism. That is to say, if you're not willing to go out in the streets and talk to somebody about salvation, maybe you're not worthy to be standing in front of the saints talking about evangelism and talking about this gospel ministry. Do the work of an evangelism. And that means you're gonna to have to study to show yourself approved. That, that means you're going to have to learn uh, how to articulate in the context of the culture where you are, the fact that the king is coming and that one day he's going to judge the living and the dead. Well, I just want to ask uh, a question and then uh, make an observation and give my last uh, parting uh, implications of what I believe this text has to say, particularly for those of us who are in this sanctuary today. Given the fact that this dying man's last admonition is to preach the word, and he uh, attaches to it a sense of urgency, not just based on the fact that these are his dying words, but based on the fact that the king is coming and he's going to judge the living and the dead. I think a useful question, particularly at this time of year, is what will we be judged on? What will be the criteria by which this king will judge his servants. It's good to know what's going to be on a test before you start studying. So since one day we will be tested and we will be evaluated by the king, not by the crowds, I think it's a useful question to ask, what will he be looking for? How will he evaluate us? And what will be the criteria by which we will be judged. I think that's a useful question, and I think that though we see the structure and though we see the thrust and we see the urgency of the text, I think if you will take the time to step back a little bit and think about that question, I think you will see within this text and within its contours uh, the answer to those questions. And let me see if I can't just cut across the field for the sake of time. He says, preach the word, but then in the end of verse 5, he says, fulfill your ministry. I think that gives us a clue. Paul is telling Timothy, he says, fulfill, and I think the emphasis on, is on your, fulfill your ministry. 
Timothy's ministry is not going to be like Paul's ministry. And it doesn't have to be. It might not be the same size and scope, it might not even be the same length of, or duration, but the bottom line is that God is going to hold Timothy accountable for Timothy's ministry and not Paul's ministry. I, I think that's good news as well as a chilling revelation for all of us that God is going to hold us accountable for not just saying what he said, preaching the word, but using what he gave us where he put us. Let me see if I can back up a little bit further. See, my brothers and sisters, it's not the location nor the size of the congregation that is going to determine how you are evaluated in the end. Now, stats are good. It's good to keep records. I don't allow the people who count the money at New Zion Baptist Church to go home until every penny is accounted for. But if we're counting pennies, surely the people are more important than pennies, and so we ought to keep records, we ought to keep account, we ought to see if we're making progress. But can I say, while we're keeping the stats, I need you to recognize, and I think this text bears it out, that ultimately, the size of the congregation you serve is not going to be the determining factor as to whether or not you've been valuable to the kingdom. Because numbers can never give the true significance of something. If I told you I wanted you to fight somebody, and you said, okay. I said, well, now listen, he's about 5'6". He weighs about 136 pounds, 140 pounds soaking wet. Uh, most of the men in the building would say, okay, I'll fight the fella. <laughs> but now, if I said, but wait a minute, his name is Bruce Lee. <laughs> that changes everything because numerical stats can never fully tell the story. The the Bible lets us know that ultimately stats the size of your congregation isn't really of eternal significance. Neither, can I say this, neither is your popularity. Now, I understand you know, that we're at one of the elite seminaries in the country, and perhaps some of you aspire uh, to, um, to have your name on books and have your name in the blogosphere as one of the great expositors. And I understand that even among the uh, teaching ministry here, that there are requirements put upon you as it relates to your tenure and things that you have to accomplish. But can I let you in on a clue? When it's all said and done, the king is not going to say, well done, thou good and faithful professor. He's not going to say, well done, thou good and faithful doctor, thou good and faithful bishop. He's not going to say, thou good and faithful pastor. If he says anything, it's going to be, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So while we aspire, I need you to understand that your personal popularity, let, let me say it a different way. Whether you serve in obscurity or on the national scene, that really is not going to be a determining factor on how you're evaluated. How do I know that? Because I read in the book that in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod was the tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip was the tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trichonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Ibeline, 
in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zebedee, where was he? In the wilderness. Didn't have a clothing allowance, had to wear camel's hair and a leather belt. Didn't have a food allowance, just had to eat the wild locusts and honey that he could find. Uh, his primary congregation was lizards and scorpions. <laughs> but he preached uh, what he was given. What was he, he given? He was just given a one-line sermon. Repent, <laughs> for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Talking about the king again. See how the king keeps on popping up? He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And people from all over Judea and Jerusalem started coming out to hear him because it's not really about the size of your congregation, the location, or even your popularity. We don't talk about all these other names, Tiberius Caesar, Herod the Tetrarch, uh, Philip Lysanias. We don't even know anything about them, but everybody knows John the Baptist even though at the time uh, he was just considered a kook who was out there in the wilderness. But what did the king say about him? He said, among women there's been nobody born who's greater than this fella. So it's not the size of your congregation, it's not your personal popularity. What will he judge us on? He says here, verse 5, fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. In the context, all the way from Lois's lap, from Grandma Eunice's, uh, for his, from his mother Eunice's uh, breast, all the way up through his mentor's dying wish, it's been the word of God that has been the primary focus. But Paul is telling Timothy, given that primary focus, use what you have to the glory of God. Don't try to do everything I did because you might not have the same tools, but do what you can do based upon what God has given you because when it's all said and done, the king is going to ask, did you say what I said? Preach the word. But did you use what I gave you? Did you fulfill your ministry? It's not dependent upon where you are because God loves the people in Paducah, Kentucky, like he loves the people in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He loves the people in Oakland, California, just like he loves the people in Ontario, Canada. He loves the children in your Sunday school class, just like he loves the students in this seminary. It's not based upon the size, it's based upon you fulfilling your ministry. This final admonition, I have three children. Uh, my oldest, uh, Jabri, is a strapping young man. Uh, looks kind of like me without the body fat. My daughter, Abeni, is my delight. Abeni means we prayed for her arrival. She's daddy's girl. Lights up every room. I have a baby boy, Titus, who has some physical challenges. And one of the things, and uh, Reverend Charlie Dates can testify to this, one of the things uh, that excites me as a father, and one of the things that is hilarious if you would come to my house to observe is that every time I come home and the children are there, they've made a game out of seeing who can get to daddy first. They hear the garage door come up, and whatever they're doing, they'll race uh, toward the opening of the door to see who can get to daddy first. Obviously, because Jabri is the oldest, he generally makes it there first. He's the strongest. And usually when I open the door, uh, he'll be laughing at the fact that he made it there first. And what I'll typically do is, uh, even though I'm speaking to him, I say, son, just stand aside. 
Abeni will come next. She'll be upset that Jabri made it to me first. I tell her, I'm glad to see you. Now step aside. Because I'm waiting for Titus. Titus doesn't have the capacity that the other two have. Uh, he has some physical challenges that don't allow him to perambulate like they can. But guess what? I don't hug nobody till everybody gets there. And when Titus finally comes, limping but laughing, then I hug all my children. Because it's not based upon your capacity. It's based upon the fact that God is asking you to do what you can do. My son, Debris, can run fast. Benny can run fast. Titus has to limp along. But guess what? I love them all the same. And I love them even more because they love my appearing. That's what Paul was saying, and that's the word I want to leave with you. He says, I finished my course. I fulfilled my ministry. You got to do what you've been called to do because I'm waiting for the crown that has been laid up for me. But here's the good news. Not only for me, but for everybody else that loves his appearing. Now, some of you can run faster than others. Some of you have the mental acumen that you can get the Greek, you can get the Hebrew. Some of you are limping along in class right now. Matter of fact, you limped in here today and going to limp right back out. But as you limp out, I need you to understand that you can get the same reward if you love his appearing and if you say what he said and use what you have. Going back to that Sunday school class, going back to that small church, or go to that large church, but just recognize it's not the size, it's not the location. It's about whether or not you fulfilled your ministry.